All right, here's the first video from chapter four. It turns out we're going to spend a lot of time in chapter four in this class, and it will kind of set the stage for everything we'll be doing for the remainder of the class until the last week. The very last week we'll do something different, but otherwise uh, what we're going to learn in these next few videos will be very relevant for the rest of the class. So there are definitely ones you want, might want to spend a little bit of extra time on. Uh, what we're doing at the start of chapter four is kind of like what we did at the start of chapter three. So just as a reminder, at the start of chapter three, what happened is we were asked to figure out how much area there was underneath the curve. And you learned in chapter three that there's two different interpretations of the area underneath the curve. It can be the percentage of all observations in the population that fall in a given range, or it can be the probability that if you select one at random, that one falls in this range. And so a typical 3.1 question might say something like, suppose the number of pepperonis on a pepperoni pizza is normally distributed, with the mean of 16 and a standard deviation of five. All right, this looks a lot like the 3.1 questions, whether they were empirical rule or the calculator function type, you were always told that the shape was normal and the center and the spread were provided for you, the mean and the standard deviation, and that allowed you to draw a picture like this. And then you were asked the question. And those questions come in several different flavors. So this can't I'm not trying to say that this is the only question you were asked, but a typical question might be, what is the probability that a randomly sele selected pepperoni pizza has more than 20 pepperonis? And because 20 doesn't correspond with a z-score of positive one, two, three, negative one, two, negative three, because it doesn't hit right on one of these hash marks, we could not use the empirical rule to solve this question. We'd have to use calculator functions. Turns out in chapter four, what we'll be doing is more similar to the calculator function stuff that you learned in chapter three. Uh, so if you could read this problem and recognize that the way you could solve this would be using the normal CDF calculator function, because that's the one you use anytime you're trying to find the area underneath the curve, and you want the area to the right of 20, so your lower bound is 20, you don't have an upper bound, so you trick your calculator with some arbitrarily large number, and then your center and spread are 16 and 5 respectively, and you type that all into the normal CDF function, and I think 21.19% pops out. In other words... If the average number of pepperonis on a pizza is 16 and the standard deviation is five, there's a chance I could get a pizza with more than 20 pepperoni, right? There's a 20% chance. I mean, I'm not saying I'm expecting it to happen or anything, but it's not super duper unlikely. Um, roughly one in five pepperoni or pepperoni pizzas would have more than 20 pepperonis under these assumptions. All right, there's your typical 3.1 question. Turns out that's not what we're doing in 4.1, but it's very related. What I wanted to do is give you that 3.1 question, and then right afterwards give you a 4.1 question, so maybe you can kind of see the difference between the two. So what I'm gonna do for our typical 4.1 question is I'm gonna start with a lot of the same things that you had here. That's still all true. I still start you out with this exact same setup, and we'll talk about if you don't have that exact same setup, what you can do, but that's all a topic for future videos. Right now, pretend you have this exact same setup, and I'm just going to change the question. So we still have all this part. And now I'm going to say, what is the probability that? You're like, that looks very similar. Good. You might already be thinking, what is the probability that? Sounds like you're going to be asking me for the area underneath the curve. Good, I am. That in a random sample of five pepperoni pizzas, The average number of pepperonis, I guess pepperonis is a plural, pepperoni, I don't know. The average number of pepperonis uh, is greater than 20. If you compare the bottom half of the red with this blue over here, you probably see a lot of similarities. It's very similar. We're still, what is the probability that? And then we still have randomly selected stuff. Over here, it was one pepperoni pizza. Over here is five pepperoni pizzas. And that is the difference between 4.1 and 3.1. It turns out that it doesn't really matter what the probability that one pepperoni pizza falls in a given range is. It turns out that's not super important for the rest of our studies in this class. It's good to know this because it sets us up for this question. But really, the question that you want to be able to answer that will be applicable to the rest of the class is not about one pepperoni pizza, but rather about the average of some number of pepperoni pizzas, in this case, five. And so it's a different question. 
So I can't answer it the exact same way, right? It wouldn't make sense that it'd be the exact same as this, but maybe since it's so similar, I can answer it in a fairly similar fashion. Turns out you can. Turns out that you could still use the normal CDF calculator function. You could still calculate the area underneath a curve. It's just not this curve. I didn't tell you this at the time because you didn't need to know it, but this thing has a name and it's called the parent distribution. When we talk about where a single observation can lie, that's supposed to be a P, it's even worse, let it go. When we talk about where one observation can lie, we're asking questions about the parent distribution. All the questions you've seen so far have dealt with this thing called the parent distribution. I didn't even call it the parent distribution because you didn't have any other distributions. So we didn't really need anything to compare it to. Right? Over here, what they're telling you is the parent distribution is approximately normal, and that's what you're drawing here. This question is not about the parent distribution. distribution. Turns out, this question, when I say this question, I mean that question is about something called the sampling distribution. New topic. Fortunately, the parent distribution and the sampling distribution are fairly similar. So a lot of what we learned before will still be applicable here, but we gotta make a couple different changes so that we're dealing with the sampling distribution um, so that we can answer this question. Note. The title 4.1 is the sampling distribution. The whole idea in 4.1 is I'm introducing a new distribution called the sampling distribution. And it turns out that in a typical 4.1 question, what happens is you're given a bunch of information about the parent distribution. All of this is information about the parent distribution. But with that information, you can answer questions about the sampling distribution. Okay, so now you're kind of wondering what is the sampling distribution? Here's an app that I really like. So this is an applet. I did not make this. This somebody else made this, but I feel like it's a really useful way to talk about what we're doing. Note that we have this distribution up here. This is the parent distribution. Right? That's what's going on here. And it tells me that the mean of the parent distribution is 16 and the standard deviation of the parent distribution is 5. The exact same numbers that I used in our pepperoni pizza example. So you can think about the area underneath this curve as the likelihood that a single pepperoni pizza will have that many pepperonis. So note 16 in the middle, count up by 5. Count up another five, count up another five. 31 would be right here. It looks like they're even labeling 32 for me in the graph. These are pepperoni pizzas. I don't want to know about one pepperoni pizza if you go back to our question. What I want to know about is the average of five pepperoni pizzas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly choose five pizzas out of this distribution. How many pizzas? Five pizzas. That's what I select right here. I hit this animate button and what's going to happen is the computer is going to randomly choose five pepperoni pizzas. And I'd expect those to be pretty close to the middle, right? I'd expect the pizza to have 16 pepperonis on it, but they don't all have 16 pepperonis on them. That's why the standard deviation is five. Maybe I get really lucky because I like pepperonis and I get a pizza with like 30 pepperonis on it. That'd be rad. Or maybe I don't. Maybe I'm unlucky and I get a pepperoni pizza with just, let's see what happens. Let's animate this. There's my pizzas. One, two, three, four, five. Two pizzas with whatever number this is here. I don't know, like 19 or so. One with 20. This one looks like it's right around 16. And this one's a little bit less, maybe 14 or so. These five black boxes each represent a pepperoni pizza. This blue box represents the average of those five black boxes. And really the blue box is what the question is about if my question is about the sampling distribution. Right? I mean, I don't know how exactly what this is. It's kind of hard to read it, but it looks like it's about 18 or so. I just chose five pizzas and the average of those five pizzas was 18. Remember what my question asked me is what is the probability that if I randomly select five pepperoni pizzas, the average is greater than 20. I don't think that that happened. I think the average was about 18 in the example that we just did. But that was just one example. Doesn't mean it could never happen. Let's try it again. All right, let's animate this thing again. Here's five more pizzas, see if I get lucky. No, not really. Right, I kind of got unlucky. All these had less than average. This one was pretty good, but these four weren't all that great. The average ended up being right here. It looks like slightly below 16, maybe 15 or so. Let's do it again. Five more pizzas, one more average. Five more pizzas, ooh, that's a bummer over there, right? I had like two pepperonis on that pizza. But note the average wasn't two. One pepperoni pizza only had two on it, which was unfortunate, but I still got these four more pizzas and they had like, I don't know, 15 or so and 17 or so. So the average of these was not two. It was just one observation was two. I had these remaining four, which put the average over here. You can keep doing this as long as you want. I'm, I don't know. I get 
uh, irrationally amused by this. I kind of like watching the pizzas fall from the sky and figuring out the average. Yeah, that's pretty good. Finally got a really good one. I, don't, I wish that these were labeled better. Uh, what did we say? This was 16. So I guess that's 17, 18, 19. That might have been 20. I don't know. It's hard to count, but maybe I just finally got a pizza. and Not a pizza. I lied. I've had several pizzas that had more than 20 pepperonis. I might have just gotten the average to be greater than 20 of these five right here. I might have just gotten really lucky. If these were the five pizzas that I bought, the average number of pepperonis in those five might have been right around 20. It's hard for me to tell on this graph. You can do this again and again and again. Note that the question is about these blue boxes, not the black boxes. So really what I need to know about is what the distribution looks like in blue. I need something kind of like the thing up here in black that shows the entire distribution, the parent population, but I need one in blue. Well, I can create one because instead of just clicking here, animate over and over again, I click this button, this 100,000 button. What this is doing is it's not grabbing 100,000 pizzas. It's grabbing 100,000 sets of five. Right? It's hitting this animate button 100,000 times. So 500,000 pizzas, right? Five pizzas 100,000 times. It'll get all those averages and it'll put them down here. And if I do that, it'll give me a look at what the sampling distribution looks like. There it is. I've now done this 100,012 times and it's giving me the mean and the standard deviation and the median. I have all these values. I could do it more and more and more. I could just keep on clicking on this a bunch of times. I'm up over a million now. 2 million. You can do it as many times as you want. And now that I've done it so many times, 10 million pizzas or whatever, I have a pretty good idea of what the population distribution would look like. It looks like this. This in blue is my sampling distribution. If we could understand this thing in blue, we could answer questions like the 4.1 question. We already understand this thing in black because we already understand 3.1 questions. If we could just understand the thing in blue, we'd understand 4.1 questions. And what I want to do in future videos is describe this thing in blue. Maybe a couple of observations. This one was approximately normal, or it was normal, I guess. This one is also, right? Just like this is symmetric bell shape, this is also symmetric bell shape. You're like, nah, it looks kind of different. Yeah, the reason it looks different is because these observations are less spread out. Note that the standard deviation up here was five. The standard deviation down here was only 2.24. They both had means of 16s, but the standard deviation was different. I wonder why that is, or I wonder if that makes sense. Maybe you could talk yourself into that. Maybe you can think about why these would be less spread out than these. We're gonna talk about that in the next video, how to calculate the standard deviation down here based off the standard deviation up here. But for now, I just want you to kind of think about it. If this distribution is approximately normal, this one it turns out is approximately normal too. And that probably doesn't surprise you. Right, if this one's symmetric bell shape, it's not a big surprise that this ends up being symmetric bell shape, but that deserves more time. We're gonna talk about that. This one had a mean of 16. It looks like this has a mean of 16 as well. I'll have to talk about whether that makes sense. But the big thing, the thing that'll be the most important is this one had a standard deviation of five and this one did not. This one's standard deviation was 2.24. And that's really important because what I'm gonna be doing in this section is drawing distributions, but not parent distributions. They're gonna be sampling distributions. And we have lots of good news. If the parent distribution is approximately normal, or we'll just say normal, Turns out the sampling distribution is also. So even though it doesn't tell me anywhere in here that the sampling distribution is normal, remember all this information is about the parent distribution. Because the parent distribution is normal, the sampling distribution is also. And the minute it tells me the mean of the parent distribution over here is 16, I know that the mean of the sampling distribution is 16. That's pretty good. I'm still trying to shade to the right of 20. Right? I still want the average to be greater than 20. So I don't know, I can arbitrarily throw 20 out here somewhere and shade to the right of 20. I still just got to figure out this area. If I could figure out this area, I'd be done. It's still going to be a normal CDF question. Okay, normal CDF always wants the lower bound. Still going to be 20. And then the upper bound, there still is not one. So I trick my calculator by putting in any arbitrarily large number. And then it wants the center. And my center is still 16. Really the big thing that's gonna change that'll allow me to answer a chapter four question, if I already know how to change chapter three questions, it's just the spread. Right? I mean, we can go to this applet over here, let's see, this tab, and the applets tell me the standard deviation is about 2.24 in this specific example. It'd be nice to know how the applet came up with that though, because if we had a formula for figuring out the spread, then we would know 
what number to put in right here. And if we knew what number to put in right there, we'd be done with the problem. Just hit enter on your calculator, spit out the answer, and we'll be done with the problem. The key to understanding this section is understanding what number goes there, and then a little bit of theoretical stuff. I'm going to talk about all that in the next video. In this video, I just wanted to introduce this idea of the sampling distribution.